Well, good morning, Antioch. Uh, great to be with you here this morning. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Rick Gerhardt. I'm one of the elders here. Uh, and it was a pleasure to show this video, which one of my sons with some of his friends made a, a couple years back. Uh, it gets pretty fast there at the end, huh? Kip warned me that uh, the stool had a little wobble to it. Well, that's okay, I've got a little wobble myself. Um, my family and I have been involved with Antioch since uh, before the beginning. So later this month, Antioch's 11th anniversary will be marked uh, sometime in October. And uh, for about a year before that, we were meeting in houses, uh, several families of us. And, and my family's been a part of that. And it's been a wild ride. Um, for many years now, part of Antioch's uh, mission statement has been that we would be uh, an authentic expression of Christianity here in Central Oregon, and that we would have a shaping voice in global Christianity. And, and the Lord has taken that willingness on our part and, and just done an amazing thing in and through us, amazing things. And so if you're, if you're new to Antioch, I'd, I'd really encourage you to, to get a hold of somebody who's been around a while and, and just learn about some of those amazing things that the Lord has, has done with this church. Where we are today is in the fourth sermon in a five-sermon series, which is meant to be a vision series. That is that we're, uh, we're trying to articulate for all of you what it is leadership at Antioch feels that God is calling us to do and be in this next season of Antioch's life. It's not a change in mission in any way, it's, it's really just a a rebranding or, or a new way of articulating what it is we, we believe God calling us to. Um, and, and so it, it has this, this whole series has really three components to it. And the first is, is just this idea of the reconciliation of all things. It comes from a passage in Colossians, which we'll get to in just a few minutes. But it, uh, it really represents what we take to be a, a very thorough articulation of the gospel, the good news of what, what God is doing in the world. And an answer to the question, what in the world is God up to? And so, so that's the first part of, of this series. Um, and together with this next verse, which comes from uh, the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5, it also answers the question of, what does God want us to be up to? That is, what is our participation in God's mission in the world? So 2 Corinthians 5.18 says, all this is from God who through Christ reconciled us to himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. So as we learn what God is up to in the world, we're also participants with, it, with him in that reconciliation. And then the third component is this piece of artwork, uh, which is behind me and now up on your screen. This is a piece of art by Antioch friend and former intern, Paul Krauss. And it's meant to be uh, a depiction of, of a biblical theology. And, and, and what it expresses is the four relationships that were broken at the fall, which are also the four relationships that God is redeeming. Um, and so the cross, the, the head of the cross would be humanity's relationship with God, right? And Ken preached to us a couple weeks ago. And one of the things I took away from that message is that salvation, which, which is bought on the cross, our forgiveness and, and our potential for having right relationship with God is really just the first step of the greater reconciliation. Um, salvation, which, which a lot of evangelicalism is all about, is really just the first step in bringing us back to God so that we can enter into lifelong and eternal life with him, come to know him better, and come to know his heart and his purposes in the world better, okay? Uh, just below the arms of the cross is humanity's relationship with self. And so one of the things that God's redeeming and has redeemed at the cross and will ultimately redeem is our own view of ourself, a, a right and biblical understanding of who we are in God's eyes, saved by grace, sinners who were saved by grace. 
the arms of the cross represent humanity's relationship with other people. And to make this artwork work, we've divided that into three sectors, uh, city, church, and world. And so last week, Pete talked about uh, how God is intending to reconcile Central Oregon and Bend, Oregon, and, and our part in that. And he took the world piece and, and looked at a little bit of how we envision God asking us to be ambassadors of reconciliation to across the world. And that's where this whole idea of social justice and, and dealing with people's poverty and sex slavery and all that sort of thing comes in to our walk as, as individual Christians. And next week, when he gets back from Italy, Pete's gonna tackle the centerpiece of the arms of the cross, which is the church. Um, so, my job in the hour and a half I have uh, before you this morning, that, that's a joke, um, <laughs> is to tackle the bottom piece of the cross, which is our relationship with creation. Um, and our role in reconciling creation to God, right? Uh, let me suggest right off the bat that, that I have a little more difficult task than Ken and Pete have. Because when you think, when, when we say that God wants us to be reconciled to himself, that God wants us to be whole persons, rightly aligned with who we are in God's eyes, and that God wants us to be reconciled with other people, I'll get a hearty amen to all that, right? But when I suggest to you that God is also in the business of reconciling this creation to himself, then I probably might get a little bit more pushback and, and, and you might get a little more uncomfortable about where I'm going with this, right? And yet this is our understanding and, and our vision. Um, I think the reasons for, for a little bit of discomfort on this topic uh, fall into a few categories. One would just be our own fallenness and our, our desire to pursue the American dream without the constraints of whether our food and our energy and those sorts of things are, are gained in a just manner that, that doesn't have a negative, an unduly negative effect on, on God's good creation. Uh, one set of discomfort about this idea would be political, right? Um, and, and I'm not going to say anything partisan except this one thing, and I'll get that out of the way, and that is that there's nothing conservative about eschewing conservation, okay? I'll leave it at that and hope that for the rest of my talk, you won't be looking at the truths that I try to share from Scripture with an eye to whether it fits with the political platform of your favorite politician, right? <laughs> Um, I think the third reason, though, and, and probably the more important one, which I'll have to deal with, uh, for being uncomfortable about this idea that God is reconciling the creation is bad theology that has infected much of the church, and, and which all of us have, have heard some of. And so we'll deal a little bit with that. Um, let me get out of the way right up front, uh, something that comes up every time we talk about this sort of thing. And that is a very influential, at least within conservation circles, if you will, a very influential article written by a guy named Lynn White Jr. in 1967. Its title was uh, The Historical Roots of Our Ecologic Crisis. And its thesis was that Christianity is to blame, it takes most of the blame for our ecological crisis. Now, there's much that could be said, much that has been said in response to White's article. Um, but I think the reality is that uh, many who profess Christianity have, in this regard, followed culture rather than the biblical mandate when it comes to how we go about living in the world. That is, uh, especially beginning in about the Industrial Revolution, when we gained the power to really have an effect on God's creation. Um, many Christians followed, not only followed along with culture in, in desiring to increase profits and uh, to, to gain energy and food in the easiest and cheapest manner without regard to any uh, concern for the just 
justice to creation. Um, but many Christians also twisted scriptures in order to justify that approach. Just as in many cases, people who profess to be Christian twisted scriptures to justify the slave trade and owning slaves back in the day, okay? Um, but as far as the bad theology piece, uh, I, I want to suggest that there's really two very different gospels alive and well in, in the evangelical church in America today. And, um, and one of those gospels, the one that, that, that we get from Scripture and which drives our mission statement in this, this whole series, is the idea that God does have eternal plans for his good creation, that the incarnation, crucifixion, and resurrection of Jesus Christ 2,000 years ago was the decisive stroke in the defeating of sin and death, that Christ will one day return to ultimately establish for eternity his kingdom here on earth, and that our eternal destination is resurrected, physical glorified bodies in eternity here with him in the new creation. The other view, which I'm gonna suggest is heretical and yet which has a good standing in many churches today, is that all Christ came to do was to save human souls. And that our destiny is to live as disembodied souls in another place called heaven, and that God has no eternal plans for his good creation except to destroy or annihilate it. You've heard that view, right? You've been influenced by that view. For now, let me just say that those are two very different views and they both can't be right, okay? <laughs> Here, let me share uh, a couple of quotes representing each of these views. And the first one would represent the historical Christian view that, that Christ came to establish his kingdom on earth. And this comes from uh, the Hallelujah Chorus of Handel's Messiah. It's probably easier for me to sing it than to say it, but I won't, I won't sing it. You're all familiar with these words. Hallelujah, for the Lord God omnipotent reigneth. Hallelujah. The kingdom of this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ, and he shall reign forever and ever. Hallelujah. Let me share a quote that represents the other view. And this one comes from, uh, well, I'm going to credit this person with it, even though I think there's a lot of, ev a lot of evangelical preachers who have, have shared this view. Uh, I'm going to credit it to J. Vernon McGee, who was so fond of it. J. Vernon McGee, if you don't know, was a, a radio preacher with a very southern drawl uh, for years and years and years. He's been dead 20 or 25 years now, but you can still hear his sermons on the radio, on the Christian radio station. <clears throat> but the quote would be, why would we polish the brass on a sinking Titanic? Okay, so this view says that all Christ did was to save human souls and that all we should be about doing is saving of human souls. That anything else, like entering into God's into relationship with God that helps us grow in maturity and understand better how to raise families or to set up governments or to do any social justice, that all that is completely unimportant and insignificant, let alone caring about the creation in which we live. So, so you understand this view, right? Not just caring for creation is pointless, but so is caring about poverty and sex slavery and all those other things. Right. I share one more quote, which represents the first view, the biblical view, and this specifically from a, a standpoint of creation care. And this comes from the uh, Christian writer J.R.R. Tolkien in his famous trilogy, the, the Lord of the Rings. So if you can remember at the end of the, I've never seen the movies, so I'm talking book here. <laughs> at the end of the third book, um, the wizard Gandalf is talking to the Lord Denethor. Denethor's whole charge as the last steward of Gondor and, and the charge to his whole line of ancestry is to keep the kingdom of Gondor 
for the eventual return of the rightful king. But now Gondor is besieged by, by its enemies. Uh, Denethor's son has just died and Denethor is about to take his own life. And the wise wizard Gandalf says to him, the rule of no realm is mine, neither of Gondor nor any other, great or small. But all worthy things that are in peril as the world now stands, those are my care. And for my part, I shall not wholly fail of my task, though Gondor should perish, if anything passes through this night that can still grow fair or bear fruit and flower again in days to come. For I also am a steward." So this is Tolkien's way of saying, of articulating the historical Christian understanding that part of what we are called to as disciples of Christ is to be in mission with him, on mission with him in the caring for his good creation because it's ultimately going to be redeemed. Now I've called that other view, the, the sinking Titanic view, a heresy. And, and that may sound strong, but I can do that uh, with good conscience because it turns out that it's a very, very old heresy that has been called out time and time again in church history. And this passage from Colossians, from which, which we get this phrase, the reconciliation of all things, although it was not probably specifically written with this particular heresy in mind, it does serve to refute this heresy. So um, I'm going to have this passage up here in, in uh, divided into three slides. But let me tell you a little bit about the, book, the letter to the Colossians. Um, it's difficult to understand exactly what the heresy going on in the early church in Colossae was because it was, a, it was a, an odd mixture of Jewish ideas and Greek ideas and, and such. Um, but the letter to the Colossians written by Paul by the power of the Holy Spirit was meant to correct misunderstanding about what Christ came to do. And this particular passage, which begins in Colossians 1.15 and goes through verse 20, is understood by most textual critics as not original with Paul, but rather that Paul is here inserting a creed that was already current, a, a brief encapsulization of what was going on with this Jesus of Nazareth and this idea that he was resurrected. And he embeds it early in this letter to the Colossians to remind them of what the gospel is. And it serves not only to establish the preeminence and centrality of Christ himself over anything else you can imagine, heavenly beings, angels and such, and, and such um, but it also establishes the holistic nature of what the redemption Christ came to bring is all about. And so it reads, he is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him, Jesus, all things were created in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him. And, and I don't wanna dumb this down for you, but you're gonna see that all things is repeated numerous times throughout this, this creed. All things were created through him and for him. Uh, and he is before all things. And in him, all things hold together. He's the sustainer of all of creation. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. And here's the really good part. For in him, all... For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile all things, the same all things that he created and sustains, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. So again, we think this, this is the, the, one of the best and most thorough articulations of, of the mission of God in the world, what Christ came to accomplish, is the re reconciliation of all things, and that includes the creation, not just human souls. Let me read a little bit from a commentary by uh, Marianne Thompson on uh, Colossians. This hymn moves from creation through redemption, speaking of them separately, but offering praise for God's work that begins in creation and anticipates the final reconciliation of all things. 
In its structure, it sets creation and redemption parallel to each other. Each has its focal point in Christ, who is the firstborn, agent, and goal of both creation and new creation. Because Christ is the agent of creation, he is also the agent of the recreation of the world. Here then, in confessional terms and the language of praise, we find testimony to the great drama of God's creation of the world and the promise of its final redemption. The God who made the world in Christ will redeem it through Christ, for God has not abandoned the cosmos and its inhabitants. So with that, what I want to do in the next few minutes is, is kind of take you on a whirlwind tour, beginning, uh, well, going from Genesis all the way to Revelation, touching down just in various places on passages that talk about creation and passages that you probably never really highlighted in your, in your Bible or, or read straight over and, and didn't realize how much the Bible really talks about creation and its its goodness and its eternal destiny. So really what I'm trying to give you is a more balanced understanding of the role of creation and our role as caretakers of creation than what you normally hear uh, in church in America. Let me, begin, let me begin with Psalm 24 though, um, which reads, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof the world and those who dwell therein. So the understanding of Jewish folks and Christians throughout the centuries has always been that the earth is not ours, it's the Lord's. Um, that, that we are just here because it's a good gift to us of God's. In fact, it turns out if, if we look at all the Psalms, which most of which begin or end with praise of God, that praise is divided somewhat equally between God as creator and sustainer of the universe and God as redeemer, specifically of the, the people of Israel, pulling them out of slavery in Egypt and, and such. Um, so there is nothing Christian about disrespecting or exploiting or abusing God's good creation. It's his, not ours. Um, there's nothing, uh, not only is there nothing Christian about bulldozing a mountain to get at the coal in the most cheap and profit-inducing way, or, or of driving God's species to extinction, but it's really quite hypocritical of us to, on the one hand, claim to know and love the creator and sustainer of the universe, and on the other hand, to disrespect or be apathetic to what happens to the creation that he created and is in the process of redeeming. Okay, um, let's go to Genesis 1 now and pick on several different verses there. And the first one would be Genesis 1.31. And God saw everything he had made and behold, it was very good. If we look closely at the major creation accounts in scripture, things like Genesis 1, Psalm 104, Psalm 148, which is a psalm of praise by all the creatures, uh, of God the Creator, uh, the latter chapters of Job in which God speaks directly to Job, what we find is not a theme that says we are superior to the rest of creation. Instead, all of those major creation passages, the theme is our shared creatureliness with everything else and the holy otherness of the Creator Redeemer, okay? Um, a couple of verses earlier in Genesis 1, 29, the crea oh, I don't think I have, I don't have it up there, sorry. In Genesis 1, 29, the creator gives to the first man and woman all of the fruit and vegetables of the garden. Free gift, have it all. But in the very next verse, God constrains that gift by limiting their use of all the, all the goodness of creation because the rest of creation, the other creatures are also dependent on the, that same food resource. And so their use of it is not to be at the expense of the flourishing of the other creatures. So we, even in the church today, we tend to believe and think that somehow human flourishing is dependent upon the non-flourishing of the rest of the world and make it, make it sort of an either or thing. Either we flourish or, and, and they don't, or, or they flourish and we don't. 
Why in the world would we think that? That's not the biblical portrayal of things, and it's certainly not true to the biblical portrayal of the kind of God, the kind of creator, redeemer that we serve. Um, so now Genesis 1.26. Then God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the birds of the heavens and over the livestock and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So theologians like to debate about what the image of God in humanity is. What I want to point out right here is that in its context, the image of God in us is the way in which we care for his creation. This is all one verse. This, this first articulation of the image of God in humanity is given in the context of our role as sustainers of the universe. To put it another way, our care for creation ought to be done the way God would do it, lovingly and sacrificially. And that you can't escape that conclusion based on the way Scripture presents it. Um, and yet we like to cling to that idea, which is, is only, only found in a couple places in Scripture, that we are superior to the rest of the animals. And I'm not denying that. But what I want you to understand is that when Jesus points to the birds of the air and says, look at how the Father cares for them, are ye not more, are ye not more of much greater value than the birds? He's not denigrating the birds. The argument depends upon the fact that God loves and cares for the birds perfectly, okay? So yes, we have a unique standing with God and a unique ability to worship and praise Him or reject the worship and praise of Him. And we have an immortal eternal life in a way that other creatures may or may not have. There, we are superior to the other creatures, but that's, that's not the stress of these passages. God cares perfectly for all that he created. Okay? Uh, let's go to Genesis 2.15, where it says, The Lord God took the man and put him in the Garden of Eden to cultivate and keep it. And all I want to share with you from this passage is that those two verbs the Hebrew verbs abad and shamar, which are translated cultivate and keep in this passage, are elsewhere in the Old Testament translated serve and protect. So the same two verbs in Hebrew are used of the high priests and their role with relationship to the holy of holies. And so by, con by connecting that, what we understand is that in a sense, God saw creation and particularly the garden as sacred space and man's role in it to be that of serving and protecting it. Uh, let me jump all the way to Ezekiel 34. And, and my point here is that I skipped right over Leviticus, but there's a whole lot of Levitical laws that deal specifically with how God's chosen people are to deal with their animals, their plants, the soil and water, the things we call creation. But here in Ezekiel, they've been disobedient and God uh, calls them out on it. Is it not enough for you to feed on the good pasture that you must also trod down with your feet the rest of your pasture and to drink of clear water that you must muddy the rest of the water with your feet? And must my sheep eat what you have trodden with your feet and drink what you have muddied with your feet? How many of you have that uh, memorized? And yet it's in Scripture. God, God cares and has cared all along about how his people uh, interact with creation. Uh, let's go to Hosea 4, 1 through 3. Hear the word of the Lord, O children of Israel. Again, the prophet calling out the people for their disobedience. For the Lord has a controversy with the inhabitants of the land. There is no faithfulness or steadfast love and no knowledge of God in the land. There is swearing, lying, murder, stealing, and committing adultery. They break all bounds, and bloodshed follows bloodshed. Well, what does this have to do with creation? The passage goes on. Therefore the land mourns, and all who dwell in it languish, 
and also the beasts of the field and the birds of the heavens, and even the fish of the sea are taken away. So here, Scripture ties humanity's sin to the ecological problems of Hosea's day. But the next passage we'll look at makes that connection even more directly. So in 2 Chronicles 36, it says, the king of the Chaldeans took into exile in Babylon those Israelites, actually the people of Judah, who had escaped the sword, and they, God's people, became servants to him and to his sons until the establishment of the kingdom of Persia to fulfill the word of, of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah until the land had enjoyed its Sabbaths. All the days that it lay desolate, it kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years. So what's going on here? So one of the Levitical laws was that the land itself, the soil on which the people of Israel were growing their crops, was to be given every seventh year a Sabbath rest. It was to lie fallow so that it could be fertile again in the coming six years. This is part of the Sabbath law. Years down the road, the people of Israel had turned their backs on the Lord, started to disobey all of his commandments, including the Sabbath rest for the land. So that had been going on. By the time Israel, Judah was taken into captivity and exile, that had been going on for 490 years. And in this passage, it tells us that the Lord predicated the duration of his chosen people's exile in a foreign capital on the amount of time in which the land that God had blessed and given them had not, ex had not experienced its Sabbath rest. God predicated the duration of the exile upon the injustice done to the land that he had given them, okay? Let me skip all the way to the New Testament in Romans 8. Uh, there's a whole lot of other passages I could have picked on in the New Testament and elsewhere, but for the anxious longing of creation waits eagerly for the revealing of the sons of God. For the creation was subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it, in hope that the creation itself will be set free into the freedom of the children of God, which incidentally is not destruction and annihilation. <laughs> um, for we know that the whole creation groans and suffers the pains of childbirth together until now. What this passage is saying is that the creation itself is not only waiting for the redemption that is coming to it, but is waiting for the followers of Christ to stand up and fulfill their role in helping to bring about that redemption. Um, let me read uh, theologian Paul Barnett commentary on this passage in Romans 8. We must reject the idea of a non-material heaven. From early times in Christian history, believers began to think that heaven was up there inhabited by disembodied souls in white gowns seated on clouds playing harps. This vision owes more to Greek philosophy than to the Bible's vision of the kingdom of God. That kingdom is ahead of us at the end of history, not above us in the clouds. It is not disembodied, but re-embodied. The creation awaits its redemption, but so also we ourselves await redemption, that is, of our bodies. Redemption in both creation and humanity is not spiritual, but physical, as the redemption of our body shows. So let me skip all the way to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 11, verse 18. And again, I, I doubt whether you've memorized or even earmark this particular verse in your scripture. So this is a picture of eternity future, praising the, the lamb on the throne. We give thanks to you, Lord God Almighty, who is and who was, for you have taken your great power and begun to reign. The nations raged, but your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and the time for destroying the destroyers of the earth. So what I want you to see here is that the saints who will be rewarded at the final judgment are contrasted with those who destroy the earth who will themselves be destroyed. 
A little earlier in Revelation, again, a picture of eternity future and, and the, the lamb on his throne reigning in Revelation 5.13. And I heard every creature in the skies and on earth and under the earth and in the sea and all that is in them saying, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. So the point is that the, the new creation, creation redeemed, will include not just people of every t t tribe and tongue and nation, but also representatives of every kind of species that God had created. Um, but if I only had one minute to share with you why I think the Colossians 1 understanding of, of what God is up to in the world is true, I would just take you to that prayer that Jesus taught his disciples. Because the very, uh, so, so the first thing Jesus tells his disciples to pray for is that God's name would be holy, that God, their understanding of who God is would be set, a, set apart in a way that he is always so much greater than we are. But the very second thing that Jesus asked his disciples to pray for in Matthew 6, 10 is, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And you understand that if, if this sinking Titanic view of redemption is true, then this prayer will never be fulfilled. That Jesus asked his disciples then and now to pray for something that he knew God wasn't gonna ever accomplish. And, and that alone should be enough to, to cause us to reject the view that God has no uh, eternal purposes for creation. Uh, the prophecies and promises made in the New Testament about the end are all about over and over again promising that Jesus is returning, that Jesus is coming back, that Jesus is going to set up his kingdom here on earth. And so the only question is, where did this idea that we were somehow going to be whisked away to another place ever come from? So let me deal with that. We've talked about it once or twice before, but it, it comes from a passage in 1 Thessalonians. And what's going on here is that the, church, the young church in Thessalonica already knows the good news, which is that Christ's incarnation, death and resurrection has caused the beginning of the last age, that the end of the old age is past, that we're now in an age of grace in which we're forgiven of our sins and that the promise is that Christ is coming back to fully and for once, once and for all establish his kingdom forever on earth. The problem is that some of the brothers and sisters in the Thessalonian church have died and so the, the believers in Thessalonica are asking Paul, what about them? Are they gonna miss out on the resurrection? Are, they, are, they gonna, are their bodies gonna rot in the grave while the rest of us receive glorified resurrected bodies just as we saw Christ have? And so Paul's answer in 1 Thessalonians 4.17 includes this line, for the Lord himself self will descend from heaven with a cry of command, with the voice of an archangel and with the sound of the trumpet of God. And the dead in Christ will rise first. They won't miss out on it. They'll be the first to greet Jesus upon his return. Then we who are alive, who are left, will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. And so we will always be with the Lord. So don't worry about your dead brothers and sisters because they'll be the first to meet the returning Lord and then we'll join them to meet the Lord as he comes back to earth. So the word rapture, which births this idea that we're gonna be whisked away from here, for, from here to somewhere else, comes from the Greek word that's translated here, caught up. We're caught up in the air. But the modern understanding of this is exactly the opposite of Paul's intention. The, the, the symbolism here, which would, would have been well known to all of Paul's readers of the day, is that when a king returns from battle to take his rightful place in his birthplace or his home ended, the people don't wait inside the city walls for him to come marching back in his victory march. They go out to greet him and usher him in with praise and thanksgiving as he enters into his rightful reign. 
That's the picture that Paul is trying to reassure the Thessalonian believers with. And it's been mixed up since about 180 years ago by modern believers into this odd heretical view that our eternal destiny is not here in resurrected bodies, but someplace else uh, for, and, and we'll be raptured from here. Um, so you follow me there? <laughs> All of the passages in Scripture say that Christ is returning. The promise is Christ is returning to set up his kingdom here. It's just an odd, aberrant theology that says we're waiting expectantly to be whisked away from here, okay? <laughs> And it has an impact, obviously, on how we enter into mission with Christ in the world today. Uh, it, it's really the decisive difference between that view that, that the Bible espouses and that view of a sinking Titanic uh, that we talked about earlier. Let me deal with one other category of uh, scriptural misinterpretation, because there are uh, about four places in Scripture, one in First Peter, one in the Gospel itself, and then uh, a couple in Revelation that, that talk about the judgment of, of the evil aspects of creation in a way that, that sounds pretty all-encompassing. It, it talks about destruction and, and almost annihilation. Okay, so let's go to uh, Revelation 21.1, which says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. So if you begin with an understanding that, our, that, that God has no plans for this uh, creation and you read this passage, well, we do use the word passed away to talk about death, but that's not what's in view here. The only thing that is passed away is all that about the creation which is fallen and not able to be carried forward into new creation. And part of the reason I know that is we have the same exact uh, phraseology in a passage that we touched down very near at the beginning of my talk, and that is in uh, 2 Corinthians 5, where it talks about our reality already at present. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. So this is the same Greek words, the same terminology here. And obviously, this is talking about us, our reality currently as believers. We are already new creations, and the old, that is that which is not Christ-like, is passed away. Obviously, there's still a sense in which there, there's work to be done in that regard. But this is, this, this is what leads Christians throughout the ages to understand that the judgment of that, that which passes away and the fiery judgment that Scripture talks about is a refining fire, not an annihilating fire. This passage in uh, Revelation is after the, the point at which Satan and all his demons are cast into the lake of fire. So, so this is a refining uh, judgment and, and not an annihilation of God's good creation. A uh, friend of Antioch, Jonathan Wilson, who teaches at Cary Theological Seminary, writes this, creation is a blessing because God's creation is the proper home for humankind and the context for human work and flourishing. To recognize creation as a blessing is to reject dreams of another world. That other world for which we may dream is already given to us in the dialectic of the kingdom that allows creation to be creation and redemption to be redemption as God brings these works to fulfillment in the new creation. The new creation is not a cosmos other than creation. It is creation fulfilled, its end realized through the redemptive work of God. In John's vision, God says in Revelation 21.5, God says not, I am making all new things. Rather, he says, I am making all things new. <laughs> okay? So what does this mean for all of us? How does this relate to Antioch's mission, for God's mission in the world and how we would participate with it? Well, let me start by, um, by sharing a quote by the Dutch Reformed theologian Abraham Kuyper who said famously um, about 150 years ago, there's not a square inch in the whole domain of our human existence over which Christ, 
who is sovereign over all, does not cry, mine. So that's my way of saying this has everything to do with almost every decision we as followers of Christ make. It, it really affects where we purchase our clothing and, and how we get the food we eat and, and where our energy comes from and things like that. Because in all of those realms, there's the potential, if not the actuality, of grave injustices done somewhere along the way to others of God's creatures or to God's land or uh, to the water and air and all those sorts of things. So in a sense, what this means to us is that we should look at all of our earthly decisions in light of whether injustice is being done to God's creation through our decisions. Does, does that make sense? Now, I'm not gonna get into any details about what that means for you. Um, the elders are not gonna show up and, and tow the muscle truck out of your driveway. Uh, and, and we're certainly not gonna show up and drop off a new Prius uh, in replacement either. Uh, the, the great thing is that like, like with these issues of, of living justly with regards to our city and with regards to injustices around the world, God has already brought to this local body of Antioch people who are already a little further ahead than maybe some of us in, in discovering what it means to live justly with regard to the rest of creation. And so we can put you in touch with people who, uh, who, who can give you the opportunity to do a Saturday of stream restoration on one of the local uh, rivers. Um, I could put you in touch with numerous peoples in this congregation, beginning with, with Evan Hendricks, who would be glad to sit down and talk with you about how to feed your family healthfully, tastily, if that's a word, and using agricultural and husbandry methods that are, that are just and sustainable and do not do injustice to uh, the land, the plants and animals, or even to the, the farming communities where, where your food is raised. Um, so I don't know how this is gonna look going forward. I don't know how often we'll, we'll preach on this subject here at Antioch. All I know that is it's, it's our understanding that part of God's mission in the world is to redeem his good creation. And part of his expectation of us, his followers, is that we would be on mission with him in that regard, that we would at least care about creation. And we'll, you know, I know many of us are here because we're very good at enjoying God's creation, uh, but our understanding is that we also need to be caring for God's creation and being part of the solution rather than part of the problem. Um, and so, uh, can you show the, the creation piece of the, of the cross? Um, so the way we've cashed this out is, is simply that the practice associated with our understanding about reconciling creation is Sabbath. <clears throat> and, and Sabbath really in this regard is an open-ended, can, can mean almost anything. The way I would cash it out this morning is that Sabbath is a practice that God instituted among his people. It applied to people and animals and land. And it was really just a way of God saying, your striving seven days a week is not what provides food on your table. Work is good, I've, I've, I've created you for work, but every seventh day you need to stop and rest and give rest to your animals and, and to the soil every seven years. And at that time to take stock, to enjoy the good gift of creation and to take stock in the fact that it is a gift and that God is the one who cares and sustains it, and that it's not, that you're striving seven days a week isn't gonna make any difference. So um, that would be my way of, of cashing out what we mean by the practice of Sabbath as it relates to our living into God's reconciliation of, of creation. I wanna take time to, uh, to call out one more practical objection to what I've been sharing with you this morning. And that is that for many of us, it doesn't really seem like God is very actively reconciling creation to himself. It seems in fact like maybe the Titanic is sinking, right? 
with all the uh, environmental and ecological bad news, it, it really does se seem like a sinking Titanic at times, right? So I want to take time to make just two quick responses to that. And the first is that we live in a world that is driven by a media that depends upon portraying things worse than they really are, <laughs> okay? The news doesn't report when a plane takes off. It only reports when a plane crashes, right? And, and we have a billion dollar news industry that is dependent on us feeling like there's bad news and we need to be on top of it, right? So for example, the truth is that the percentage of people living below the poverty, the extreme poverty line today is less than 10% for the first time in history. How many of you knew that? Okay. Likewise, the rate of infant mortality is the lowest it's ever been. Uh, the rate of violent crime in America is at its lowest point in the last 50 years. And that whole thing which, which drives most environmental conversation about exploding population growth, it's not true. The population rate is declining and when young people of today become of childbearing age, the population rate will actually be declining. So much of the environmental urgency of the past several decades, started by a, a really influential book called The Population Bomb from the 1960s, it was all wrong. <laughs> and yet, most of your contemporaries would, would accept that popula human population growth is a big and ongoing problem. It is not. So not only does the media portray things as worse than they are, but the only way to generate dollars for conservation and environmental concerns is to instill an urgency which in turn depends upon casting a very bleak picture of the way things really are. So. If some of you have been around Antioch for a while, you're, you're familiar with uh, the Christian conservation organization Arasha, which is in 20 different countries working with local communities to improve their uh, local environment and at the same time improve their living standards. Um, how many of you know about the Great Green Wall? So there's a reforestation project that is 10 miles wide and crosses the entire middle section of the continent of Africa. That is dramatically changing not only the water table for the better, but is also improving the climate and the economic condition of all the people who live in that belt of sub-Saharan Africa, the Great Green Wall. And I, didn't, I saw one hand of, of anybody who'd heard of that. <laughs> but the second response I would make to this idea that it seems like the Titanic is sinking uh, would be to refer to a passage of scripture which is found in Mark 4. And that is that the early disciples were in a similar situation. They were in a boat that they took to be sinking just like J. Vernon McGee and a whole lot of other people today take this boat that we're in to be sinking. <laughs> they were with the Lord Jesus himself. They'd had plenty of evidence for his power over nature and, and his deity and all those sorts of things. And he told them that the plan was we're gonna cross the Sea of Galilee to the other shore tonight. And yet a storm came up and they were despairing of their life. They were certain that they were gonna drown, that the boat was gonna sink. And Jesus was asleep in the boat. So he was doing something even less significant than polishing the brass on the boat. He was sleeping until they awakened him. And when they awoke him, he was angry with them. Not because he was missing out on his sleep, but because they didn't have faith in their leader who was in control of the whole situation.
right? So he stilled and calmed the storm. They got across the sea. The boat didn't sink. And I think we find ourselves in that same situation. When we, when we believe that this is a sinking Titanic, that, that everything's going to hell in a handbasket and there's nothing that can be done about it, we forget who's in control. The promise of Scripture is that God is redeeming this creation, that he has redeemed it at the incarnation, crucifixion, resurrection, that he is redeeming it through the power of his Holy Spirit that raised Jesus from the dead and through the agency of his followers, you and me, and that he will ultimately redeem it once and for all with the new creation at the end of the age, okay? Um, one of the songs we'll sing as we take communion in a few minutes is, is the Christian classic, This Is My Father's World. And one of, the, one of the verses says, though the wrong seems off so strong, God is the ruler yet. And that's my message to you today. So I'm going to pray and then we'll have a chance to, to meet the Lord in, at the communion table. There'll also be opportunity back there at the exit signs. There'll be people willing to pray for you if you have a prayer concern, uh, praise or, or a concern that you want to share. And then there'll be opportunity to, to come partake of the, of the communion table. There's two tables in the back and two tables up front here. Uh, or you can remain in your seat and, and pray silently or, or just sing along with the worship team or whatever. Uh, what I want you to understand about the communion table today that is that the bread and the wine are a physical reminder of a very physical thing. That the Christ's incarnation and death and resurrection were not just spiritual events that the disciples saw and touched his glorified, resurrected body and that we are promised the same thing in the end. So, so while this is a, a very unique opportunity each week for us to, to interact spiritually with our Lord, Creator, Redeemer, it's also quintessentially also a physical thing and that the bread and wine remind us of that. So, so let me pray for us. Uh, creator and Redeemer, we just uh, are eternally grateful for, for creation and redemption, which we understand to be inextricably intertwined. We acknowledge that you, your creation needed redemption. We acknowledge that redemption couldn't occur without this wonderful creation to begin with. We confess that there are times when we've... Uh, followed along with culture rather than had a biblical and a Christian understanding of your love and concern for your creation. We pray here this morning that we, as we seek to learn to know you better through your word and your Holy Spirit, as we, as we understand more deeply in weeks and years to come the mission that you would have us on with you in creation, we just pray that you would open our eyes to how we might walk more humbly with you as we go through this creation. Guide us and teach us. We're open to hearing from you. We thank you and give you all the praise and glory through the name of our creator, redeemer, Jesus Christ. Amen.